Mike Sullivan is the head coach of the Pittsburgh Penguins. He joins us on 31 Thoughts, the podcast, courtesy of the Coaches Association. We'll get into that a little bit later on. Uh, Mike, thanks for joining us. We're sitting here in Toronto a day after you and the Pittsburgh Penguins lit this city on fire. It seemed as if it was, and I know you want to be humble about it, puck on a string at times for the Pittsburgh Penguins on Tuesday night. At times as a coach, do you just find yourself sitting back and just becoming a fan and watching what this explosive Penguins team can do? Well, I think you're being kind to our our Penguins team. You know, it was... Uh, I think our power play was was really good last night, and that really helped us with with the end result of the game. Certainly, Toronto had their moments where they they had a lot of uh, zone time and and a fair amount of scoring chances as well. When we look at our overall team game, uh, we know we can be better defensively. We know we can be tighter and and harder to play against in certain aspects. So, um, you know, I, I think we're trying to have an honest assessment of of where our team is at. It's the only way we can improve. Uh, having said that, uh, there are moments when 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 we sit behind the bench and we watch our power play or we watch some of our star players uh, when they're at their very best, and and we often marvel sometimes at what they're able to accomplish out there with the puck. They're uh, they're impressive, and uh, they're just elite players in their own right. They're a privilege to coach. Uh, it's fun to be around these guys day in and day out, and and watch them. Uh, watch them practice and watch them go about their business every day on how they how they try to hone their craft to be the to be the best and I don't know that there's a better example in the game than Crosby with with his uh, just an insatiable appetite to be the best player in the game you know it's not by accident he's a, he's a very gifted player and mm-hmm. and he's elite in his own right in that regard but the work ethic that he has and the time that he puts in on a daily basis to to be the best is impressive. I wonder when when you have guys like that, how much of it is this is what we need you to do, and how, or how you how I'm going to ask you how to play, and how much is it okay? You're on your own here. You can do what you feel you have to do. Well, we're a coaching staff that that believes in. Um, not taking the stick out of our players' hands. You know, when you when you look at the group of players that we have and, and we, we sat as a coaching staff when I became the coach of this team and try to implement a game plan uh, that could play to the strengths of our core. And that was the very first question I asked uh, our coaching staff when we talked about how we were going to play. And uh, when you look at the core guys that we have, we, we believe that, that one of their greatest strengths is their, is their speed game. Uh, and not just their foot speed, but how quickly they think the game and their anticipation skills and you know and their puck skills, their ability to move the puck and change the point of attack and and create uh, and and so we we wanted to try to implement a, a game plan that uh, that could leverage those strengths and so uh, there's always that fine line I think as a coach where you want to implement a, a certain amount of structure. Uh, with with our group and it, we've certainly done that but we're careful not to implement too much structure because we don't want to get in the way of some of that creativity so you know i we we allow for that we encourage that uh we we certainly need to play within structure and the, and the phrase i always use with our guys is you know when when you guys have the puck there there are certain things that are non-negotiable most isn't and we're going to allow you the, the the latitude to make plays. We'll stay out of your way. When we don't have the puck, you've got to meet us halfway in that regard, and you got to you got to play within the the structure of the team. And 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 to their credit, they've uh, they've been great partners in that regard. I'm curious, Mike. After you took the job, when was the first time you had to sit down Sidney Crosby and say, "I don't like this," or "You're wrong about this," for lack of a better term, you had to discipline Sidney Crosby. I, I don't know that I've ever had that conversation with Sid. I, you know, there have been critiques of his game, uh, and he handles those really well. Can I ask you, like, what was the first time you ever had to say or critique his game, and how that conver- Like, were you nervous to do it? No. Okay. No, I, I just think it's my responsibility, and and I tell our guys that. You know, I I, I told them on on the first day that I met them that my commitment to them was I was going to be honest with them good or bad and so and and i believe it's the only way you can make progress so uh when we play well 
uh, we tell them we play well, regardless of what the score is. You know, some games you can play extremely well and you come out on the wrong side of the score. Uh, when that happens, with as a coach and staff, we're the first guys to you know to compliment our guys and tell them how they play. You know, we try to give them an honest assessment, game in and game in, game in and game out, day in and day out, of of how our our, our overall team game is. And 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 I have the same commitment with with individuals. And so. Uh, you know, I, I just think we, we try to do it the right way. We try to do it respectfully, but uh, we don't mince words because, I, you know, I, it, it, you don't want to it, sometimes uh, if you try to be too politically uh, tactful, uh, the message can get lost, <laughs> so to speak. Yes, right? I get that. So, so I, and, and our guys, they, they handle it extremely well. I, I, I just think, uh, you know, Sid's a guy that wants to win. He looks for feedback. You know, he likes the feedback, and and we offer it to him. We, you know, when it's uh, when when it's good, we we encourage. We, you know, we encourage more of of his play. When when we think we need him uh, to stop on more pucks or cut his skating down or stay closer to the puck or whatever it may be, we try to share those observations with him as well. But um, you know, we've got a lot of respect for our players, uh, but. Uh, as I said, my my commitment to them that it was I was going to be I was going to be straight up with them. I'll be honest with you guys, and uh, you know, and, and and we'll we'll try to create a partnership here where where we can try to problem solve and 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 meet the challenges that this league ultimately presents. I want to stick with Crosby. Uh, and when I found out that you were coming in to visit us and come on the podcast, I went to my bookshelf and pulled out my favorite hockey coaching book. This was uh, published in 1969. Uh, Anatoly Tarasov, uh, Road to Olympus. Fascinating book. I don't know if you have a thought on uh, Tarasov specifically, but there's one passage in here that when I read it, and not to be too overly maudlin about Sidney Crosby or this passage, um, it makes me think about Sidney Crosby. And it goes like this. And this is all sort of, this is the height of the you know hockey cold war between the Soviet Union and Canada. So a lot of it reads like Soviet propaganda at times. But um, Tarasov, talking about passing says, the main thing about our passes is that they come from the heart. Our boys are not stingy when it comes to passing. The Soviet pass is a new embodiment of our teamwork. And when I watch Sidney Crosby make plays, and whether it's a Dominic Simone pass in the Minnesota game, whether it was Tuesday night, the pass to Brian Rust across the crease that no one sees coming, uh, which was a beautiful play, I say to myself, when I look at Crosby making plays, and passing and finding these guys that no one sees out there. It's almost as if he's saying to his teammates, don't worry, I'll find you. Play your game and I'll find you. When you watch Sidney Crosby play, and when you think of those two plays specifically, and you've seen much more, obviously, than we have of Sidney Crosby, when you see some of these passes and these plays, what goes through your mind? To me, it's don't worry, I'll find you. Well, you know, he, he's... Uh he never ceases to amaze us. You know, I, it, it becomes the new normal in Pittsburgh because he does it night in and night out for us. And, uh, and he, he's, you know, he's just one of those guys that has elite vision. You know, he's a generational talent and those guys don't come around that often. And, uh, and so to, to have the opportunity to coach him and be around him every day and witness what he does, uh, on the ice is, uh, you know, it's it certainly from, from my standpoint, it, it's a privilege to, to be around them. You know, the, the one thing I, I will say is, is the advice that we give players when we put them with Sid is just play your game because he hasn't, he has the ability to adapt his game to the guys we put around him. Um, you know, one, one of the discussions I've j- had just recently with Jason Zucker when, when we got him from Minnesota in the first uh, game or two that he was that he we, we put him right with Sid, as, as you guys know. And we our observation was he was a lot of times he's he's waiting for the puck. And and one of the things that that I said to our coaching staff that we need to ha- we, we need to help Zuck with is is he doesn't need to wait because Sid will get him the puck. We're, we're trying to utilize uh, Jason's speed. We think the speed factor that Jason brings is a competitive advantage. So we want him to utilize that. We're trying to get him into that extra gear. And we don't need him to wait 
because when he plays with Sid, he doesn't have to. Sid's going to get him the puck, and I and I think that's what you're alluding to with with his with his passing ability. But it but it's all it's almost like and and the coaching staff we 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 kind of chuckle about this a lot. You know, when we talk about Sid and his overall game and just his just his intellect, you know, we we always we always say that uh, that that Sid's playing chess when some of the other guys are playing checkers, right? And he he's just one of those he's one of those elite players that 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 anticipates plays two and three moves in advance, mm-hmm. and and so the guys that play with him. They have to get used to that. You know, they get surprised sometimes by when they get the puck because they don't expect it. Is is that because he plays on his backhand so much, and players uh, well, don't? Like, I don't know that we've seen anyone going back to Dave Keon in the '60s and '70s to see him play on the on his backhand as much as he, Sid does. He does. He does have the ability to play a lot in his backhand, but but I, I just think it's his, his his ability to think the game, and he's creative. He's he's real creative. He he'll. He'll do things, uh, and and he'll use bank passes and how he use the use, use the boards or the high flip to a certain area, or he'll use the back of the net uh, to pass to himself. He does, he does, uh, he he thinks he thinks in such a creative way. I don't know that I've ever been around a player that scored more goals off the back the off the back of a goaltender from below the goal line, or from a from a sharp angle. If he sees a a window of opportunity where the goalie's not not tight to the post, he seizes those moments better than any player that I've ever witnessed. So he's the, the his ability to think the game the way he does in such a creative fashion is I think, and and then he has the skill set that to act on it and and to execute those those type of plays. And 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 really for me, that's where it where it stems from. You know, it, it's his playmaking genius that. That I think is is the impetus of of his ability to distribute the puck the way he does. I want to take you back to last summer. I, I can imagine that as a co- the best thing about being the coach of the Penguins is that while these two guys are here, Jim Rutherford and the organization make it very clear we're in it to win it every season. But the end of last year, it was pretty clear that you guys tried as an organization tried to rattle Malkin's cage a bit. And there were some rumors that he was going to be traded. Do you and enjoy- did you ever say, "Hey, is this true?" Or did you ever talk to Jim Rutherford about it? I wonder what you, as a coach, are thinking while all of this is going on. Well, the first thing I would say is, is Jim and I really don't concern ourselves with all the speculation and the <laughs> and the rumor mill that you guys uh, <laughs> that you guys partake in. I don't on know a what you're talking basis. about. Yes. Uh, so. We we know the truth and and what's on the inside, you know, and and so uh, we really don't have a lot of discussions around that because it's really not anything that we can control. What I will say is is that that we do communicate with Gino, and uh, both Jim and I both communicated with Gino throughout the course of the summer, um, and had a, a a few discussions with Gino and uh, and just just our um, you know assessment of of where we were at and. Uh, and and where how we were going to try to move forward and and, and improve, and so um, you know those discussions were had with Gino so that so that he understood you know what what the expectations were going into training camp. But you know I, I give Gino so much credit because he's such a driven guy, you know, and and uh, you know it wasn't like it wasn't like Gino didn't have a a, a good year last year. He had eighty something points. He was over a point a game. You know, but he's capable of more. You know, most specifically his just his 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 two way game, right? His uh, his ability to uh, to influence outcomes in the win column for us more consistently, and and so Gino and I had that discussion last summer, and he's and he's well aware of it, and he takes ownership and responsibility for his own game. That's what I love about him, and uh, he he was he was bound and determined to. to to prove that that he's he is still the generational talent and the, and the elite player that he has been for a decade plus in this league, and uh, and he showed it through his work ethic coming back to training camp. He's had a terrific year for us. You know what I really like about the two of those guys is that when one of them is out, the other one really seems to like the challenge of making sure the team is okay even without one of them there. I they really seem to like it, and I kind of really enjoy watching them. When the other one doesn't play, yeah, I, I think they embrace that challenge, and they're so competitive. 
I, I think they thrive on it, you yeah. know, and so uh, and, and it's happened on more than one occasion with both guys. They've they've they, they've shown an ability to elevate their game and uh, and and take their take the whole team on their back, so to speak, uh, you know, through their example. And, and so um, I, I just think it's an indication of how competitive both of those guys are. When you have a team as skilled as yours, and we've seen other teams in the NHL highly skilled, and sometimes they tend to chase an extra pass that they shouldn't have made. Um, They'll chase an easy game because they're so highly skilled. How do you make sure that your Penguins don't do either of those things? Well, it's a constant discussion. You know, I think when you look at elite players uh, in the game, they're... I think that that's that's a tendency that's that's a common denominator, and so uh, it, you know we we talk up to our power play all the time about making sure we don't try to pass it in the net. You know we've <laughs> got to shoot the puck, and sometimes uh, sometimes the simple play like a shot on goal creates more opportunity off the rebound or the spray or or, or whatever it may be, and 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 so I, I don't think you know we're just we're just as much inclined to be susceptible to overpassing or uh, trying to get too cute, so to speak, out there. You know, we've had discussions with our group this year about, you know, and maybe this is the silver lining in some of the adversity that we face from an injury standpoint with some of our key guys going down for the length of time that they did. It was easy to convince the group that we we needed to, to trust one another, establish a team game, and that team game is rooted in simplicity. And and so when when we get we we've had success through that process. So as we start to get healthy guys and our key guys back in the lineup, our challenge is is can we still bring that same level of simplicity to our overall team game? And and so that that's a discussion that we have with our guys almost daily. And so I, I don't think our team is any different than some of the other teams that that have quote unquote star power or elite players. You know, I've said to our guys from day one when I became their coach that in my experience, I've never seen it. I've never seen a team score their way to a championship. You know, you have to have the ability to be hard to play against. It's not always about, you know, you or as we say, you know, you don't always have to outscore teams. You got to outplay teams. So scoring's part of it. But keeping it keeping it out of your net is also a part of it. Or if you have the puck coming through the neutral zone, maybe there isn't an opportunity to create because you don't have numbers or you don't have time and space or it's late in a shift and you don't want to feed an opponent's transition game, which may be very dangerous. And so though that that discipline is all part of learning how to win. And uh, and so that that's the that's the challenge I think of coaching is is to try to, you know, is to try to convince your group to buy into that. To, to that discipline of of making sure that it's not just about scoring goals. It's about playing the game the right way. My first year at Hockey Day in Canada was 0304. The first playoff series I ever did was Boston Montreal when you were coaching the Bruins. And I'm just wondering, is there something that 2020 Mike Sullivan thinks about or looking back at 2004 Mike Sullivan and it makes you laugh about you then and you now? Oh, I I uh, I think I'm a very different coach today than I was back then. And obviously, when you have you know 15, 16 plus more years of experience and uh, and everything that I've gone through as a coach, uh, it's just I've been through so many learning opportunities. And so I just think that's the evolution of a coach. And so, is there anything in particular you remember back and you say, "Oh boy, I, I can't believe I did that," or that's there- one I wish I could have over. There, there are, you know, I look back on that experience and, and I, and I would do some things differently for sure. And, uh, and, and I, I think once again, the benefit of experience, uh, just offers me that perspective in, in, um, in how to deal with, with, you know, certain situations that arise that, that teams, uh, in this league are faced with. And, uh, and, and so I, I look I look back on that that experience a lot um, and and think about you know 
what I what I liked that that we did as a coaching staff, wh- what I might do differently in order maybe to 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 get a different uh, get a different outcome. Uh, uh, but once again, I just think that's part of the evolution of coaching. I, I wonder about your relationship with officials, and the reason I ask that is Elliot and I talked to Sidney Crosby in Chicago at the NHL media tour. And I said to him, or maybe Elliot made the point, I can't recall, if he could go back and do anything over again, what would you change? And Crosby right away said, oh man, I was too hard on officials. Yap, 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 I couldn't stop. You know, I've spent a lot of time apologizing since because I realized, you know what, I was out of line, my bad. I'm going to spend a lot of time apologizing. How are you with officials then? And how are you with officials now? Oh, I think... I think we've all learned through that. I, you know, it, and it's just the competitive nature of the game, and I think that's what drives all of us. And so, um, unfortunately, sometimes the 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 officials uh, probably are the uh, they 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 uh, they get they're, the brunt. They're in the line of fire, so to speak, and uh, they they have a tough job. It's it's a hard job, and you know I. I think we all have so much respect for what they do for for you know for our game, and um, I do think I I try not to be as hard on the officials as a as a coach now that's coached for fifteen plus years as I was when I was a young coach. Um, I'm not going to lie to you; I still have my moments. You know, some some nights I drive home, you know, in the car, and I say, "Geez, I wish I I you know I should I should have stayed off the the refs a little bit." Um, but once again, it's it's a competitive environment and uh, it's emotional. And when you care, uh, sometimes you can get caught up in it. And so, um, you know, we all, I think, try to, you know, I talk to my coaches all the time about being a check and a balance ag- against one another. And, and you know, the, there are certain things you can control. You, we've got to try to pick our spots. I mean, it's part of coaching, I think, sometimes to advocate for your players in certain situations. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, we, we, we try to let them do their job and we're going to try to do our job. And, and that, that's the message that we, we all try to remind ourselves of. I want to ask you about the Coaches Association. You led it for a couple of years. Number one, who are the bigger group of complainers, coaches or players? <laughs> oh, that, that's probably a tie. <laughs> that's probably a tie. <laughs> that's a very good politically correct answer. Um, you know, we talked to Rick Bonus a week ago, and I asked him about this. There, there was a time when, as a coach in this league, you basically had no protection. Um, you know, the teams made it very clear that you were at their whim and didn't have a lot of protections. Things have changed a lot. The pension, uh, the work that's being done on on medical plans. Just you know, when when you take a look at how far it's come. Did you ever think you'd get to this day where the protections for coaches were going to be better because of the work that's been done? Well, we certainly hope so. Um, you know, I think uh, I think when in in all the time that that I've been coaching in this league, and it started with George Kingston, and and uh, you know, when Scotty Bowman was was involved with with George as well, and trying to organize the coaches or advocate on the coaches' behalf, but. Uh, and and they did a terrific job in the, in the early stages and and but I think when when Mike Hirschfeld took over, uh, I think Mike brought it to another level. It is just as far as organizing the coaches and and trying to identify maybe where the where the needs uh, where the needs are and how the coaches could work together with the with the NHL to try to improve. Um, the opportunity and and the working relationship between the league and and the the coaches association and I and I think Mike's done a great job as far as organizing all of us uh, because coaches want to be coaches mm-hmm. you know they they really don't want to pay a whole lot of attention to pension plans mm-hmm. and uh, and things of that nature but but those things in reality are very important they're, they're important to people's lives and their families and and security and so. Um, so I think I think Mike has done a really good job at just organizing the group, and 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 working with the league through some of the minutia to uh, to to get to the point where we are right now, and it's it's really encouraging. You know, when you were at um, at BU, you shared the ice with some pretty special hockey players. We think of uh, John Cullen and Tony Amante. I mean, this was a star-studded group. Um, and you also had one of the more influential coaches that the game has ever seen. 
How often do you think of Jack Parker? Oh, I think of him a lot. I, you know, I, I think I think Jack had such a huge impression on me, uh, not only as as a player but as a coach today. You know, I, I still t- I still talk to Jack, uh, you know, a few times a year, and and there there have been situations over the last couple of years where I've called him just to seek his advice. Hmm. And uh, you know there there isn't there hasn't been too much that Jack hasn't gone through as a coach uh, that that we couldn't we we couldn't learn from him and uh, and he's always so gracious and take and taking my call and 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 I know some of some of his other players that that have gone on to coaching uh, ha, have done the same thing but I, I think of him a lot you know he's. Uh, I, he was a terrific coach. You know, he he wasn't warm and fuzzy by any stretch. Mm-hmm. He wasn't easy to play for. He was real demanding. Uh, but w- but one of the things that that I try to utilize in in my coaching philosophies or my coaching styles is, you know, it, as hard as as Coach Parker was on on us as players, I always walked away from the experience knowing that number one, he cared about me as a player and he wanted he had my best interest in mind in trying to make me the best player I could be or the best teammate I could be. And he was simply trying to help the Terriers be the best team they could be. And I always felt that way as, as hard as sometimes he was, he wasn't always my favorite guy with some of the conversations that, that he had with me, but that's coaching, right? Sometimes you're going to tell players, you need to tell players things that they don't want to hear and it's in their best interest. Uh, and, and, and Jack never shied away from that stuff. But as a player, you always felt like, you know, he was the, the sincerity that that he brought, and uh, I just always knew that he cared about me, and and I've tried to, I've tried to bring that to the way I coach with with the guys that I interact with on a daily basis here. We'll close with this one then. Do you have a favorite Jack Parker saying? Uh, yeah, my my favorite. My favorite, and I've used this with some of our players, is you know when when uh, if if you were if something didn't go the right way on the on the ice or or uh, you know you, you didn't do your job in a certain circumstance or situation, he would drag you down the hallway in Walter Brown Arena, and and he would he would always say uh, he would always say to you, let me let me tell you this, not so that you can understand. But so that you can't possibly misunderstand. <laughs> I love that line. Still use it? I use it once in a while. <laughs> once in a while. There were some expletives in there as well that uh, that you guys can use your imagination. But uh, that was one of my favorites. That's fantastic, Mike. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, continued success here. Your Penguins are a force once again, to no one's surprise. Thanks so much for this. Thank you, guys. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Mike.